Now let's look at some characteristics of the capacitor. Want to consider and keep these in mind as you do analysis with circuits that have capacitors. If we have here just a capacitor with the equation I is equal to C to V dt, a few things to remember. First of all, if the voltage across a capacitor is constant, the current flowing through it must be equal to zero. So if the VDT is equal to zero, i.e. constant voltage, then I is equal to zero. Or a way to think about it is this. If the voltage across a capacitor is constant, it looks very much like an open circuit. Now, this comes down to something, a couple of distinctions, a couple of abbreviations I want to bring up right now. DC and AC. DC stands for direct current. AC stands for alternating current. And these abbreviations actually go all the way back to basically more than 100 years ago, whenever we were first electrifying the country. In other words, Edison Electric and Westinghouse were putting up competing systems for running electricity to people's homes. So DC, direct current, was a constant voltage. AC, alternating current, was a sinusoidal varying voltage. And we'll talk more about these concepts later on. But nowadays, DC and AC have a kind of broader definition. DC means that the voltage or current is constant with respect to time or invariant with respect to time. And when you think about it, just about every circuit we've looked at so far during this course has been a DC voltage or DC current. It had a constant value. It didn't change with time. Alternating current AC, well, in a broader sense, we now say that an AC voltage or an AC current is one that varies with respect to time. So in other words, if you see an expression for a voltage or a current that includes T, time in it, then you're dealing with something that's AC. Well, what we're saying then is, in effect, a capacitor behaves like an open circuit in a DC situation. So in other words, it's an open connection. So if we have a DC circuit example, then the capacitor itself is just going to act like an open circuit as opposed to a short circuit. All right? So that's the first point to remember. Second, and this is actually very critical because this is going to become very important when we start going into our, our, our examination of first order circuits, and that is this. The voltage across a capacitor cannot change instantaneously. And what do we mean by that? What we're saying is the VDT cannot be infinite. So you look at the voltage across a capacitor. You can't do this. You can't, for example, with respect to time, take the voltage and have a discontinuity. 
because along that discontinuity you have a slope that's infinite. We can't have that. And why not? If the VDT is infinite, that means that I would be infinite. So the VDP cannot be infinite since I would be infinite. You'd have infinite current if this happened. Well, see it right here in the equation. I is equal to C times infinity, then I is equal to infinity. So if you could have an instantaneous transition for the voltage across a capacitor, then you'd have infinite current and, uh, as I always like to say, the universe would be destroyed because that's what infinite infinity means, right? Literally infinite. Well, obviously it doesn't happen. The, university, the universe doesn't get destroyed and therefore we can't have an instantaneous change in the voltage. Now keep once in mind, once again, this second principle is going to become very, very important to us later on. Then third, an ideal capacitor can be disconnected from the rest of the circuit and will store energy indefinitely. So an ideal capacitor will store energy indefinitely in an open circuit state. In other words, if you disconnect it from all other components. So in other words, I could take a capacitor and I could charge this capacitor up to some voltage, disconnect anything from it and just have that capacitor and hold it and the electric field will be maintained in the dielectric. And ideally it would be maintained indefinitely. So this turns out to be very important in a lot of electronic applications. The idea that a capacitor makes for a very convenient and easy to use energy storage device. Okay? So these are just kind of the basic principles of capacitor operation. And as I said, you're going to see these later on. All of these ideas come up later. Well, let's now look at an example now that we've kind of looked at the characteristics of a capacitor. Let's do a simple circuit example to kind of put all these things together. Voltage, current, power, energy. Let's create a simple circuit. And in this case, we're going to take a voltage source and connect it across a capacitor. Let's say this capacitor has a value of 0.2 farads. And of course, the voltage across the source is also the voltage across the capacitor. And by the pass assign convention, this will be the current, direction of the current in that capacitor. Now let's assume that this voltage, this voltage is a time varying voltage. And I'm going to actually draw a plot of what that voltage looks like. So here we have time in seconds, and my voltage does this. It starts at zero, it rises to a peak value of 10 volts in one second, and then drops down back to zero at, the, at, at time t equal two seconds. So notice, at no point does the voltage change instantaneously. There's no discontinuity anywhere in this graph. 
So I've got that across my capacitor. And I'm going to go ahead and plot the current. Well, let's think about this for a moment. I is equal to C dV dt. So what's the slope? If I look at the slope here, I'm rising 10 volts in one second. So I have a slope of 10 volts per second. Then I'm dropping 10 volts in one second. So I have a slope of minus 10 volts per second on the other side. And now I just plug this into this equation and I graph out the current. And I'll see something like this. So 10 volts per second times 0.2, I will have a current of 2 amps from 0 to 1 second. Then as the slope goes negative, minus 10 times 0.2, I'll have a current of minus 2 amps. So there is my current. Let's try to make this line up here. Here's my current rising, falling, and then you see the current matching that derivative times the value of the capacitor. So this is my current, I of t. All right, what does power look like? Well, power is going to be equal to VT times IT. So I'm going to take this graph and multiply it times that graph along every point. And if I do that, what I'm going to get is something that looks like this. where my power starts at zero, zero times two. It increases up to a value of 10 times two, or 20 watts. Then abruptly, the current goes to minus two, and then I'm going to go from a value of minus 20 watts, and then I'm going to decrease back to zero again. So zero to one second to two seconds. All right, so that's the power. Now notice, in this section of the graph, power is greater than zero. In this section of the graph, power is less than zero. So in this part, the capacitor is absorbing energy. Power is positive. In this part of the graph, power is negative. The capacitor is generating power. It's releasing energy back into the circuit. So it's releasing stored energy. So here, positive power, it's absorbing energy and storing it. And then negative power, it's releasing stored energy until it goes all the way back to zero. And now the capacitor is totally discharged. Finally, let's plot energy. Energy is equal to one-half CV squared. I take this voltage, multiply that by itself, in other words, square it, multiplied times 0.2. And if I sketch that, I'm going to get the following. 
So here's energy. Once again, this is as a function of time. I start at zero. I charge up to 10 joules. Okay. So 100 squared times 0.2 times 1 half. And then I will discharge back down to zero joules at two seconds. So note that the peak voltage corresponds to the peak energy stored in the capacitor. So this kind of all sort of puts it together. I'm absorbing energy. Energy is accumulating. I hit a maximum. Then I release the stored energy and the energy then decreases back down to zero. And once the voltage across the capacitor reaches zero, it is discharged and there's no longer any stored energy. So this is a nice little, uh, nice little kind of simple example that sort of puts all this stuff together and illustrates these relationships. All right? So next time we will go to the next step, let's look at how we can combine capacitors, just as we combine resistors in series and parallel combinations. Turns out we can do exactly the same thing with capacitors. So let's take a look next time at the equations we need to describe that.